In this section, we'll discuss how to deal with rotation about an arbitrary axis using the inertia tensor. Consider a body uh, of arbitrary shape uh, rotating in the coordinate frame x, y, and z with a rotation vector omega, which has components along the x, y, and z directions. Now, in uh, many of your previous intro physics classes, you will have taken a rotation vector that points along uh, either the x, y, or z axis. But sometimes that's uh, not convenient or even possible uh, to treat a problem, and so uh, we need to know how to deal with, uh, we need to know how to calculate the angular, angular momentum vector for uh, a body of finite volume in the case that we have arbitrary rotation. And as we'll see, that that, that will involve using the moment of inertia tensor. So for a body made up of, of a series of finite uh, particles uh, numbered alpha, the angular momentum vector is, of course, just the sum over alpha of the moments of, of the angular momentum of each individual particle, which is given by this expression. And we've already seen that you can write uh, the velocity vector that results from rotation as omega crossed into a uh, position vector for that particle. And so we need to calculate this thing and then take a sum over all the particles alpha. So let's start by first calculating uh, this double cross product. It turns out there's a nice way to do this um, which the book doesn't actually walk through in detail. Now if you have the cross product between three vectors it looks like this. You can re rewrite it uh, as the dot product uh, between the different vectors multiplied by the vectors themselves and so this is the so-called back minus cab rule. So A crossed into B crossed into C is the vector B times the dot product of A with C. Now keep in mind, the dot product with A with, of A with C is a scalar, so it comes out to be a number like 1, 5, 10, something like that. And so we're multiplying the scalar by a vector, which means we're going to get back a vector. So you take back minus cab, and here again you've got a dot product between two vectors that you're multiplying by a vector, so you get a vector again. Now you need to get a vector because this cross product should give you a vector. Okay, so this is very important. This is not the magnitude of B times the dot product. This is the actual vector B, which has three components, x, y, and z, multiplied by this dot product. Likewise for this term. So not, be sure not to get confused by this. And also, you'll need to keep track of the order in which the different vectors appear. A comes first, then B, then C in this double cross product, and so these vectors have to be rewritten in exactly that order, uh, the, in exactly the order shown here. Um, you can't just arbitrarily switch B and C and A, they have to be in exactly the order shown. And so coming back, coming back to the double cross product that we looked at before, R crossed into omega, which is crossed into R again. The first R, that's going to be our A, the omega, that's going to be our B, and the second R is going to be our C vector. And so we write back minus cab with that uh, definition. So our first term is going to be the vector omega times r dotted into itself. So that's back minus cab, remember? And so now the second term is going to be r vector times r vector dotted into omega. Okay, now let's write each of these terms component at a time. So we're going to break, break them up into x, y, and z components. So this first term is going to be omega x omega y, omega z, times r dotted into itself, which is going to be what? x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Okay, so this, remember, this turns into a vector, so it's going to be these things multiplied by each of these terms one at a time, and that will give us a vector. Next, we'll subtract off r times r dotted into omega, so that's going to give me x, y, z as a vector times x omega x 
plus y omega y plus z omega z. Okay, now let's write this out uh, as all together as one vector, so we'll combine these two vectors together. One interesting thing to notice here is that this term, I can multiply by this term, that's going to give me x squared times omega x. And if you look up here in the first term, you're going to see that I get one of those here with a positive sign. And so the product of this with this is going to cancel with the, pro of the product with this with this. And we'll say that leads to a nice uh, simplification. Okay, so let's focus first on just the x component of this double cross product. So for our previous uh, arithmetic, we see that we get omega x, so the x component of the rotation vector, uh, times x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus omega x squared minus omega y times x times y minus omega z times x times z. And we can see that this is going to cancel with that. And so for the x component, we get what? Omega x, so the x component of our rotational velocity, a rotational vector, times y squared plus z squared minus omega y x times y minus omega z x times z. And so the x component of this, of this expression here depends on the product of the x component of the rotation vector times the radial distance from the x-axis squared. So that's x, y squared plus z squared, that's the radial distance of some point from the x-axis. And then there are these funny cross terms here, x and xy and xz. You're going to get something very similar for the other terms, the y and the z term. You'll find out that the first term uh, in each of those components will involve the product of the corresponding um, component of the rotation vector times the radial distance squared from the corresponding axis, and then you'll get similar uh, funny cross products here. Okay, so let's, with this in hand, let's go back to look at what our sum over alpha will look like. So coming back to our original expression for the total angular momentum vector, remember this sum over alpha of all of this. If we focus just on the x component, then we see that the we have the same sum over alpha of this expression here. We see we, each of these terms uh, is being added together, and so we can actually uh, break the sum up into three different pieces, which will involve a sum over alpha and one of the uh, rotation vectors components. Now, keep in mind here that omega x, that is independent of alpha. Omega y, independent of alpha. Omega z, independent of, of alpha. So the only parts that depend on alpha is the mass, and the components here. So let's break that, break this big sum up into pieces. And so here are our three pieces. The first term here involves the product of the x component of the rotation vector with a sum over alpha of this business right here. So again, this is going to be the mass of particle alpha times the radial distance of particle alpha from the x-axis, y squared plus z squared. And so what we're asking here is, what is the mass weighted distance from the x-axis for the whole physical body that we're interested in, all of the particles that we have. We have some similar, although different expressions for the other two components of the sum. So here we've got the y component of the rotation vector times the sum over this thing, and then the z component times the sum over this thing. Now these quantities here are related to the amount of material in our body and the way in which it's arranged. So for instance, if our body were uh, arranged around the x-axis, so this number were really, really big, then this sum could turn out to be really, really big, and so then this term in the angular momentum vector might, and the x component of the angular momentum vector would dominate. 
It's also interesting to note that we have x, y, and z component of the rotation vector being multiplied by uh, each of these terms. And so this looks a lot like um, the dot product of a vector with some quantity. And in fact, um, these quantities here turn out to be the components of the moment of inertia tensor. So this term right here, this is the x, x component of the, of the moment of inertia tensor. This right here is the x, y component of the moment of inertia tensor. And this, this right here is the x, z component of the moment of inertia tensor. So again, thinking of the uh, components of the moment of inertia tensor, for the x component of the angular momentum, we need to calculate each of these three sums. And we can write the moment of inertia tensor, big I, in this way. So here that top row, that represents these three terms that we were just interested in. The next row, these three terms are going to be involved in calculating the y component of the moment of inertia. Or excuse me, of the the y component of the angular momentum vector, and then these three components at the bottom, those are going to be involved with calculating the z component of the angular momentum. And it's important to keep in mind that this moment of inertia tensor, this is a, a, a tensor that we calculate for a body uh, of a particular shape when we've defined our x, y, and z coordinates. And so it's, it's an intrinsic property of a body when we define a coordinate system. Now if we were to rotate the coordinate system around, then of course our x, y, and z components are going to change, and so the moment of inertia tensor itself will change. However, if we assume that the coordinate system is fixed, we assume our body is fixed, this moment of inertia tensor is just a quantity that is determined by the coordinate system and the mass and shape of the body. It represents the difficulty for changing the angular momentum of a system. So in that sense, it's the same thing, uh, it's a type of inertia for rotational motion of a body. Just as the mass is, represents the inertia of a body when we're thinking of linear displacements, the moment of inertia tensor is the resistance to a change in the angular momentum of a rotating body. And now let's see how you apply the moment of inertia tensor to actually calculate the angular momentum vector given a uh, rotation vector. So here's our equation relating the angular momentum vector to the moment of inertia tensor and the rotation vector. So keep in mind, I is a moment of inertia tensor. It's a matrix. And so in order to calculate the angular momentum vector, we need to do matrix multiplication of I on omega calculate L. And so remember, omega is given by this thing right here. And so L, the x, y, and z components of L, will be uh, the matrix product of I with omega, the vector. And so I'll just write out the first, uh, the first line of that. So we can see that L sub x is going to be I x x times omega x i x y times omega y, i x z times omega z. And so we get i x x omega x plus i x y omega y plus i x z omega z and then the other components. Now I won't, I won't uh, work through all the other components if they come out exactly the same way. Again, we're going to do for the y component of the angular momentum vector, we take i y x times omega x, i y y times omega y, and i y z times omega z, and so on. Now you can write all this in shorthand in this way, so you say the ith component of the angular momentum vector is equal to a sum over j of the i jth component of capital I times the jth component of the angular momentum vector. I sometimes find all of this um, index 
uh, arithmetic kind of confusing. And if you're ever in a point where you don't understand which I's and J's you're talking about, just go back to using X, Y, and Z. I, I can't think of an occasion where I have calculated uh, a moment of inertia tensor in anything but an X, Y, and Z coordinate. So you're probably always safe replacing I, J, I's and J's with X, Y's, and Z's if you need to keep track uh, of the different components and you don't want to get lost in the uh, I and J sort of arithmetic. Um, and so uh, this gives us a way to calculate the angular uh, momentum vector for uh, rotation about an arbitrary axis and for an arbitrary x, y, and z coordinate system. So we can choose any x, y, and z orientation we like and calculate the angular momentum vector in that coordinate system when we know what the shape and mass of a body is. As we'll see in the next section, uh, we can actually simplify this equation quite a lot and get rid of those funny x, y, and you know x, x, z terms that show up uh, in the moment of inertia tensor. If we choose the right orientation of x, y, and z, it turns out we can diagonalize, we can diagonalize the moment of inertia tensor, and so that we'll just have the ixx, iyy, and izz components, and all the other components will end up being zero if we choose the right kind of coordinate system. Also keep in mind that this uh, formulation for the moment of inertia tensor holds even when we have a, a continuous body, so a body not made of individual discrete particles, but actually um, uh, made up of little infinitesimal particles. In that case, of course, our sum over alpha turns into an integral over the volume of the body. Uh, the book works through some nice examples of this. Uh, I won't do that here, but I would suggest re uh, reviewing the examples in the book.